I just want to invite, invite everybody to our paleo meeting for June. Uh, today's discussion will be collecting Maison Creek fossils. Um, and as we go on, do a little introduction about the location. Uh, things have changed quite a bit over time. As you may notice by the maps, where we are today and we were where we were back then, 307 million years ago, we're right next to the southern portion of the equator. Um, tides were affected by our orbit of the moon and the length of days was only almost 23 hours, very different from today. Things changed quite a bit. Um, the member that we are in is the Francis Creek Shale member. Um, it's just above the uh, Colchester coal member itself. Uh, deep time, think about how things were back then, um, was variable. We had um, changes of glacial intervals. Uh, so we were shifting from cold or cool and wet seasons and changing to warm and dry seasons during interglacial intervals. Um, swamps and intertidal bays with <clears throat> areas where fresh and salt water were intermixed. So in effect, in the places that we are collecting, we not only can we find fossils that are uh, marine that are freshwater based, but also saltwater based, somewhat intermingled. Um, during this time, the Pangea was forming from the collision of um, Gondwana land and Euro-America continents. Um, what kind of bios did we have at that point in time? Uh, we had both Essex and Braidwood. Essex was more marine, uh, although Braidwood in itself had some of the similar um, animals, uh, Braidwood would lean towards more freshwater based animals uh, from bivalves to crustaceans. Uh, you can also find uh, shark egg cases and fish scales in Braidwood buyout, somewhat similar to the Exix. But your Exix also had things like jellyfish, sea anemone, fish, bivalves, crustaceans, worms, shark egg cases, our wonderful tully monster, amphibians, sharks. Um, a lot of the sharks will be really identified by their teeth that will be or can be in our concretions. And copolites, which can be kind of boring, but they're relatively interesting because they can have bits and pieces of what was being consumed at that time. So you can find bones in copolites. You can find shellfish in copolites, all depending on what that creature was eating at that time. Um, looking at the map, see if I can get my mouse to work here. I'm thinking that our Braceville spoil pile that we've been going to is just a little bit above the interstate um, I-55, I'm thinking it's close to where my mouse pointer is at this point. Uh, although it's not very well shown, you can kind of see where the different buyouts were interconnected. Where you're from mine eight on down, it curves and goes around the corner and comes out towards uh, the Grundy and Livingston County uh, boundary lines. Uh, today's environment, which is more important to us, um, it is a, our main topic is Maisonia Braidwood State Park. Um, it was originally owned by Peabody Coal Company. Uh, it was a huge strip mine. It's an area of nearly 100 different ridges, ranging from just a couple feet high to close to 50 feet high. Um, the shale in those piles have reverted back to a clay. Uh, I don't know how deep you'd have to go to even be able to find any intact shale besides the hard shale, harder shales that might be erupting out of the surface in certain areas. Uh, it's a very large canopy of trees today, uh, thorny shrubs in places. Uh, there are also quite a bit of poison ivy in certain areas. Um, some of the trees, I believe, are cottonwoods, probably some walnuts intermixed. Um, a lot of forsythias have been there for decades, and that accounts for a lot of the uh, 
woody type plants that are in the area. Um, the state park itself has uh, quite a few hiking trails. Um, their difficulty levels ranges from lightly moderate to difficult. The trails themselves may be okay, but the trails getting into the ridge lines are the most difficult parts. You're talking about, in many places, walking on clays, which can be very slippery when wet. And during humid times, it also can be very slick. Um, the best dates to collect ranges from March 1st to mid-May. After that time, you have problems with days getting longer, contrast being affected by both ground and tree cover. Um, it's really hard to find uh, contrasting colors and shapes with bad lighting and the dappling from trees and overgrowth can make it very difficult. Um, another thing that's kind of important to keep in the back of your mind are ticks. Now today, um, we have a wonderful example. I went hiking a couple days ago at the uh, local um, forest preserve, uh, Crabtree Nature Center. In a half hour, I got six ticks on me. So anywhere you have higher populations of deer, we're gonna have higher populations of ticks. So be very careful when you go off season, off season, what I call off season is in the summer and fall because ticks and sugars can be an issue. Um, in September is cooler, less of a problem with ticks, but the burrs and sticks make it even uh, more difficult to get around than in the spring. So really the best time is to go hunting in the spring. Um, Illinois Department of Natural Resources is our, spart our starting point. Um, it's the best way and place to go to start learning. Let's see if this will come up. I'm pulling up their website. And let's see if, bear with me. Looks like I may have to end the show to get it open. Uh, can you all see that okay? Uh, this gives you an introductory to uh, the state park. Um, they have a home page, which gives you a general descriptive. Um, it's a multi-share location, so there's fishing. In fact, they even having, have fish tournaments there during the summer. The place we want to go is activities for, for the main part. We have our fossil collecting season, which is March 1st to September. And we also have the uh, link to their fossil collecting permit. Get back to our show. Um, do an overview of what the permit looks like a little bit. That's if it'll let me. It looks like in the show mode that it will not let me. So more ways than one to skin a cat. Uh, they do have some examples in this permit. The permit is relatively old. Uh, something to keep in mind, it does have different sites marked with their numbers. Something I have never done. Um, you may notice lake six, lake number six, seven and eight and nine and 10. To my understanding, there are places there you can also collect. And to my understanding also that there is more plant material there than um, animal life. So it's something to keep in mind. Uh, it gives you some basic images of what the fern fossils look like, but it, sadly it doesn't show you a lot of the animal fossils that are also available within the Masonia. It also has the permit. Um, the permit is annual. Really, there's nobody managing it, but I would suggest having one on hand. It also di dictates what the rules are, so common sense. Um, they also have Maps, I might as well go to that point at this point in time also. Bear with me. Uh, 
And their map also gives you a basic outline of the state park. Uh, this large wide area is Braidwood Lake. It has islands. You can also collect there, but in order to get there, you need a motorized boat. You cannot kayak or canoe. Uh, the waves are very high, considering that uh, the lake itself is above ground. In effect, it has berms going our way around it, and winds can pick up and whip up the lake quite easily over time. In, in a short time. Uh, there are different maps that I would like to talk a little bit about. The state park map is just one of them. Uh, another tool that you'll be wanting to use is a satellite view from any of your uh, iPhone or mapping softwares that might be on your computer. We also have an aerial photo of the mine that I have been using for some time to help me determine where to go and look. And also we have a longtime member that had also created a map of sites that this person has gone collected over time. So this is a very simple view of um, Ponderosa Lake. It may look very familiar if you've seen the map before. It's kind of an L shape with a little hook off to the side. This is what it looked like in the 1970s and 1990s. Um, I'm going to go and zoom it a bit. Excuse me, I'm having to move things around on my desktop so I can move things on the screen more easily. Um, as you can see, we've got ridges all over the place. And the ridges are the places we really want to focus on when we start collecting the area. And this is one of our club members' maps and locations of fossils that have been found in the past. Um, I collect with several friends on and off throughout the years, and this map is relatively consistent. Um, bear, bear in mind that it could be 100, 200 square feet in that area, but you may notice we have documented fish being found, shrimp. In this general area, I have found fish and shrimp, so it is relatively re reliable as a source. Back down to the nitty gritty, what tools do we need? Um, a regular rock hammer. Um, in this case, you don't wanna use a rock hammer to really split open your rocks. You can use it for tapping down the road when you start doing your freeze saw to see if things have gone and grown a crack, but really it's more to get it out of the ground when you can see it. Another tool, a cultivating rake. Um, this is a four prong rake but it's not one of those hand type rakes that uh, maybe has a handle of about 15 inches long. It's a full handled rake and is used for regular cultivating. Um, as one of the rules at the uh, state park is you can't dig. One of my main reasons for not digging is um, you're using a cultivating rake. You've got seeds of everything of all sorts we start breaking your surface of the ground, we're gonna help nature take over and you will have all kinds of plants and such growing in the area where you originally had done some scraping. So just be aware of that. Um, another one of the rules is you can only bring home a five gallon bucket of concretions. Uh, for myself on average, I'm usually about a quarter of a bucket or, or a little bit more depending on how successful I am at the site. Uh, most of the time when I'm going out to sites, I'm using my backpack. You'll find it much easier. You're freeing up your hands a little bit. And the cultivating rake also will be a great tool to help keep you balanced. Um, again, we're going up and down ridge lines and it's not the friendliest of territory. So I really suggest uh, trying to use your backpack and only carry out with the bucket once you're done for the day. 
Um, cloth bag is very useful. You're gonna be going from site to site, ridges to ridges. If you find a good ridge uh, with a lot of nice shapes, a lot of nice concretions, you're gonna probably wanna separate them out into different bags so you know what came from where. Um, personally, I use a GPS. It helps me find locations and I mark them so I can go back to them over the years. Another important thing is bug repellent. DEET is primary. Um, and even better would be something like, um, um, I can't remember the name of it, is Sawyer product, permethrin. Um, it will do a better job at repelling ticks, but also permethrin will eventually kill ticks. Um, ticks have a lot of diseases and you really need to protect yourself against them. Uh, what to look for. Um, one of the signs of concretions in an area are red chips. Now, if you may have noticed in the previous image, our hammered concretion, it was probably a jelly, concretions have layers. Not only on the layer in which the fossil may have reside, but there's also a iron siderite like layer on the outside of most of the concre a lot of the concretions. But also through natural freeze thaw cycles, uh, a lot of the concretions will in effect explode. Um, when water gets inside the rock, winter comes, goes through several hundreds of freeze thaw cycles over the decades, you will get chips. And that is a great sign of where to look for concretions um, that would be collectible. Um, where do you look? In effect, everywhere. Um, it's always been unusual or not so unusual to go to a very end of a ridge and have a concretion pedestal right at the end of a ridge. So you're more or less looking everywhere. Um, as things erode out, you'll find them on the sides. If you get more erosion, you'll find them at the bottom of the ridges. Um, sometimes you will want to look around logs, especially when they're laying across the length of a ridge. Um, it acts as a trap. In fact, personally, sometimes I purposely put logs down to go and check sometime in the future. Same thing for leaves, piles of leaves down deep crevices. I use the leaves as traps also, so I can come back in a couple of years to go and check them out. Um, always look for uh, down trees, uh, especially when they're blown over, the roots will pull the uh, shale up and the clays up and you might be able to find things there. Um, also burrowing animals, although be careful if you smell something, you don't wanna go near that burrow. burrow. Um, I found five concretions just going through the tailings of some critter making its own home. Um, game trails are also very useful. Uh, deer feet are much smaller than ours. They press down on the shale, they press down on the clays. Um, eventually they help erode the shale and clay away from that area. Um, I've seen areas in which deer paths have been over a foot deep just because they've been used so frequently. So that's another great place to look when you start collecting. Um, another important thing are the lever rights. As you can see in these, uh, this current image, all the diagonal concretions that we have here. Now, as it relates to uh, pit 11 area, diagonals have not been productive at all. And probably the reason we see so many is for decades people have been collecting, they've been leaving them behind. So leave them right there. They're not uh, worth even trying to get to open up. Another one is your siderite. Uh, this is not a great example. Um, they're usually in a plate, the size of a closed fist in width or even an open, fit, open hand. Uh, they're generally very red rusty colors with more uh, sharp edged than your rounded concretions. Uh, I found that you can find fossils in terrestrial sites, but not in this environment that we're trying to collect in Maison Creek. What to look for. Uh, more than anything, I wanted to give you a feel of what the concretions will look like. More importantly, not what's in the inside, but what's on the outside. Uh, this is a perfect example, just recently found this year, 
of a Exacella. Um, some people say they're jellyfish. We had recent uh, research come out by Roy Pletnik, who feels it also, could also be considered a sea anemone. Um, it's still open for debate, and you know, we won't really know until we step back in time when we can travel through time. Um, they come in all kinds of shapes, uh, sizes, but many of the shapes will be oblong and or round. So be aware, if you see something round, it could be a jellyfish. Um, jellyfish are so common, they are left behind by regular collectors. So uh, if you find something, have at it, have fun, bring it home for the kids. I give them away at Halloween. Um, this next couple of images are shrimp. Um, in this first case, it's a, a Kenthetelson. Um, you may notice it's very small. There may have been two in here one time. Um, only one half was showing up of the concretion. Uh, the other half was blank. So it, in this case, it looks like a peanut. Um, so shapes are kind of important. Um, usually the surfaces are smooth, but they can also be rough and uneven. Uh, it all depends on what kind of torture nature has put those particular concretions through. Uh, this next concretion is a bellitocin shrimp. It's an average shrimp. You may notice on the outer surface of the exposed um, concretion, we have an area missing. Just like I had originally showed, it can be like onions. The outside shells can pop off over time as things freeze thaw. Um, this is an average bellitocin. You can hardly see the legs. The body is through here. The legs are here. And part of it is already missing. We also can find bivalves. Um, in this case, um, Mazonia maya. Um, some of them are relatively nicely preserved. We also can find ferns. Uh, in this case, this one was found uh, near Ponderosa Lake. Uh, actually, both of these, uh, they're Micronopterus. The concretion in this case probably was around four inches, five inches in size, was already opened. And you can kind of tell by how textured and green it is. Algae has penetrated into the rock. Now for our best friends, the telling monsters. An important thing to notice are the shapes of the concretions, what they look like. Um, the very first one actually had an outer shell that had come off in the freeze saw process. Now the question is, how do I tell that it's a telly monster? One of the biggest clues is the eye bar. You can kind of see that going through the concretion at this point. The tail itself is kind of twisted and wrapped. You, can, you can't really tell that there's something really there, but it's uh, some, a lot of times they get preserved in the odd positions. The second one, you notice the curvature to the concretion, also the curvature to the tele monster. It's very rare to find a tele monster with a claw or connective tissues to what the claw was attached to, but I believe this is the claw. Um, and this little bar going across here, I think, is the eye bar. So you can kind of see that there's a theme going on. The tele monster is curved. Our concretion is curved. The eye bar is very well pronounced along with the eyes. And same thing on the other side. So shape is a telltale of what possibly could be in your concretions. And bear with me, I'm going to be locking the talk. Our next important part is opening our concretions. Um, in the olden days, a lot of the old timers would just hold the concretion up and whack it away at it with their hammers. Um, a lot of nice concretions, a lot of nice, uh, nicely preserved fossils have been somewhat lost due to that process. Um, so I would strongly suggest using freeze thaw. In effect, you're getting a small or medium sized watertight container. Uh, putting your concretions in there and layering it water and let them soak for a couple days. Uh, for winter, uh, a lot of people just leave the concretions out in these containers, let the freeze thaw process work over time. I would suggest 
especially if it's a nice cold winter, bringing them inside, thawing them out every once in a while, and then cleaning out the debris that sometimes happens when uh, the freeze thaw is occurring. Uh, not only will the concretion crack open, but also the layers will chip off. As part of the process, once you've let the concretions dry, it's okay to tap, but do not be, don't be vigorous. Um, let the process work. Uh, sometimes a concretion can take 100 freeze thaws before something opens. Other cases like in the jellyfish, it'll take maybe five three saws and you'll have a very nicely formed jellyfish inside. Um, at the end of the winter, take the concretions out of the containers, out of the water, let them dry out and put them in a cold, dry place. Um, one of the reasons you see a lot of red chips is the environment that they're going through. They're chemically changing. Um, so you wanna have a nice cool environment relatively stable temperature wise to help the concretions uh, or prevent the concretions from changing chemically. Uh, the freeze thaw process is relatively the same if you're using a freezer or a refrigerator freezer. Um, in this case, again, you're gonna be soaking the concretions in the water for a while. And then you wanna put the concretion in your freezer for at least a couple days. Again, smaller the container, the better. Um, I've seen people with buckets and buckets of concretions, leaving them outside in the, uh, to be in the weather all the time. Um, a lot of times you will have a bucket of mash after a couple winters. Uh, they break down, they fall apart very easily depending on what the matrix is of the concretion itself. Um, once you've pulled the concretion out, let it dry out a little bit. Um, Lost train of thought. Um, wash away all debris. And again, you're going back to the process of lightly tapping if you want to, and then put the concretion back in a full container of water and let it soak for a day, and then get back into the freezer and repeat the cycle all over again. Um, it doesn't hurt to every four or five cycles, let the concretions dry out partially. Um, doing so, sometimes the cracks will show up more easily and come apart more easily. So something to be aware of. Um, you want to make sure that the concretions are fully saturated. Uh, they are hard and it does take time, but water does get into the uh, voids, especially the voids near the fossils themselves. And you will be uh, very surprised at the quality of the fossils using this process of opening up concretions. Um, here are some methods. Some people, okay, me, tried to use to open concretions. Um, boiling hot water treatment, not a good idea. It doesn't work. Um, sometimes it'll just fall apart. And also you're adding heat, which may have bad effects on the concretions themselves anyway. Um, shocking them open, uh, throwing them right from the freezer to the boiling water. That's nice to have a nice warm place to go and sit during the middle of the winter, but that doesn't work. Um, Hammer your concretion on the floor in your garage. I've found some really hard concretions and I've got some very, very nice divots in the floor of my garage. Um, my last and only other attempt to open a concretion, some other method is the microwave oven. Yes, I put in the microwave oven. It did spit, hiss and fall apart. And I don't know why, but uh, a few months later, it stopped working. So um, it was an old microwave. Um, unopened concretion storage, as in anything like we've been trying to pass along, you wanna keep your concretions in a relatively controlled environment. You don't want them too hot, don't want them too cold. So the best thing to do is put them a cool, dry place like your garage if you have the space and let them rest in there until you start processing them. Um, another important thing is cleaning your concretions. Now, I don't mean soap and water cleaning, getting the dirt off, that's a normal thing. But a lot of times your concretions will have a white film. Um, sometimes the same kind of film that you get around uh, leaky faucets. Um, 
that film can be dissolved by using vinegar. Um, that does not include things like septarian uh, concretions where you can have uh, calcite forming inside uh, the voids of a concretion. Uh, again, you're gonna be soaking the concretion in water. The whole idea is to keep the vinegar from penetrating into the concretion. You wanna break down the white particles, not the fossil itself. Um, one of the mixtures I've seen, um, me, I've been a little bit more lazy and just put in vinegar, not always a good idea, but uh, one point part white vinegar and four parts water is probably the safest path to take. Um, if you are nervous about doing this, use a concretion that you don't find useful and test with it. See how the vinegar solution affects the concretion itself. You want to check the fossil every 10 to 15 minutes to make sure you're not losing definition of the fossil and also to make sure the white stuff substance is going away. Uh, again, you want to be delicate. Um, cotton balls or a very soft toothbrush is probably the best path to take when trying to remove the white substance. Um, you want to keep trying until all the white stuff is gone or it doesn't come off anymore. Um, Again, you want to protect the fossil from the acid. So you want to rinse it under cold water for 15 minutes or so, and then soak it in water for a half hour or even longer if you're comfortable with that. The water is not going to hurt anything. It's just going to help uh, weaken the acid to a point where it will not affect your concretions and the fossil on them. Um, care of your concretions. Uh, a lot of folks over time have put substances on the uh, surface of their fossils. Um, what it does is it makes it shiny. Sometimes it's a egg-based solution. Sometimes it's a basic glue. Um, uh, another glue, a P uh, PSA, I think it's called, I can't remember, Varnak. They all put a sheen to it. And whenever there's a sheen, you lose contrast to the fossil. So I strongly recommend not placing anything on the surface of the fossils, just let them dry out naturally and put them on your favorite shelf to, for display. Um, Keith, one, one thing I heard that they used to put on was Krylon. Krylon? Yeah. Okay. And, oh. I, um, kind of a sidebar. Uh, I also know people who have used hairspray. Now, there are places where you can find shale that has the carbon of the fossil in the shale itself. Um, if you ever are lucky enough to find fossils in that state, you have to let those dry out extremely slowly. Um, put them in an un, uh, unsealed plastic bag, let them dry out naturally. Then I would suggest using a hairspray. Don't use them on your concretions. Um, also, to protect the fossils themselves, I would suggest using uh, paper bags. They're low in acid and low in sulfur. Um, using things like Kleenex, um, paper towels, those generally will have a higher acid content, which means in time you'll start losing contrast to your fossils. Um, identification. We'll see if this works once I get past this page. Uh, we have Two main websites, um, Maison Creek Collections database, which is in uh, the Illinois State Museum and managed there. Uh, it is a database based on the fossil name. So if you don't know the fossil name, uh, you're going to have a hard time finding a match of your fossil because you'll have to go through a whole bunch of images in order to find a match. Same general thing with the Field Museum. It also has a very nice collection uh, of very nice beta database of different uh, Maison Creek fossils, also very useful. Um, one of my king things is my crutch is the uh, Jack Witchery books. Um, this going makes those available through our website. Um, if you really get into Maison fossils, I strongly recommend at least getting one or two of the books. Um, one of our plans is in the future is uh, 
making Ascone folks available to help in the identification of Mazan Creek fossils. Uh, one that will be put in place, I'm not quite sure. Um, more places for an identification. Um, if you are familiar with uh, the Fossil Forum, there's a lot of big um, Mazan Creek collectors that often surf there. So that's another place you can bring things out to see, hey, what is this? Um, and there's a few other sites. Um, and Facebook also has a few sites also as it relates to collecting. Um, another part of identification is misidentification. Um, here's two nice little examples. Um, our mind is great at imagination. We're very good at finding patterns to things, but sometimes our imagination gets in the way of the pattern. Um, you may notice at the very top, we have these white lines. Um, a lot of concretions, a lot of fossils will go through a dewatering process. And when that occurs, calcite can accumulate in the cracks in those places. So how can you tell the difference between something that is actually a septarian concretion and something that is actually a fossil. Um, in this example, we have septarian and a sea cucumber. A sea cucumber, you'll notice there's a pattern and a shape. All the cracks generally will form up in a uh, basic pattern and you will be very, uh, once you have something to compare with, uh, it'll be very easy to make a dis uh, discern the difference between the two fossils. Um, now I'm going to give you a little bit of a test. All these concretions were found in the Pit 11, uh, Pit, Pit 11 area. Um, the question is, which one is the concretion? And it's just something there, but not a fossil, and which one isn't? And if you want to speak out, be my guest. So which ones are concretions? without fossils and which ones are actually worms. Now being the expert Mason Creek person that I am, okay, start laughing, go ahead. Uh, I think number three is one that's not a fossil. And I know number two is, I mean, I think. <laughs> yeah, those, number two is. Those look like eyes. It's one of the jawed worms, but the head's missing, the jaws are missing. So we ha I, think, I don't have a real good way of identifying. I think they all have fossils. Um, I'm pretty sure this one is a, a fake. Uh, I could not find anything with a lens um, or anything else. No. We got uh, these little things are just mineralization points. Mm. I was thinking, hey, maybe it's a tully monster. It's got eye bar. Oh my God. No, mm. not quite. Got three more for you. I have number six. I opened one up and it looks like just like number six. Yes, that's one of the jawed worms. And five are. Four, I don't think so. Anybody else? Number six was too easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, number four. Yeah, it's just uh, mineralization. Uh, if I put it in vinegar, the white stuff would probably go away. Number five, I think, might have been called a wolf worm. You can say, see some of the segmentation going on both sides, and it kind of loops through in a half of an S. Um, I didn't see any jaws to this one either, but um, we pretty much found the, uh, the fossils. Um, one more piece is reporting findings to science. Um, those of you who have the permit from uh, Bravewood, Maisonia Bravewood, uh, at the very last page, there's a place in which they would like us to report. I've been very bad at doing that myself, um, but it's a nice thing to donate, uh, contribute to science. Um, I have the address here if anybody is interested. Um, I hope to do it this fall if I don't procrastinate too much. 
Um, I'd like to thank our contributors and sources. Uh, Andrew Young and Rich Holmes over time have contributed to our uh, website and I have stolen a lot of information on um, uh, cleaning and storing and prepping our, taking care of our concretions from there. Um, a very useful book is the Comprehensive Guide of the Fossil Flora of Maison Creek and also the Maison Creek Fossil Fauna. I also had taken some information from USGS. Some of the maps were from there. So from here, um, we can go ahead and open up questions if you'd like to continue. So who's, who likes, uh, I'll buy pizza if somebody wants to come look at my concretions to tell me what I found. Um, <laughs> Cause I'm not sure. I, some of them look like something, but I'm really having a tough time. Um, how good is your camera? Pretty good. Um, I would suggest trying some raking light and taking some pictures. Um, we also have our own website, or um, website, email address, and it wouldn't hurt to send it off to our address. We can try identifying some of them for you. Okay. Um, also, someday we'll have meetings open up again. I don't know how far you are from uh, College of DuPage, but we can also take a look there. Uh, once things return back to normal, we usually have a show and tell at the College of DuPage and people bring their fossils and we usually try to identify things there. Also, you can bring, if you come to the field trips, you can bring uh, fossils there and there's usually a number of people at the field trips who will help you out. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. We go to Brace, we go to Braceville Spoil Pile twice a year, two weekends. So there will always be somebody there. And I usually bring books there to sell so we can have also um, paper-based paper sources. Uh, what about going to Bracewood is to bring home rocks, not to take rocks there. True, and you may end up uh, donating them to the giveaway pile. <laughs> Oh, Keith, I wanted to mention a great talk, by the way. Um, when you were discussing um, the, uh, low, the southern section of Maisonia South Unit, you referred to Monster Lake as Ponderosa, the large L-shaped lake you call Ponderosa. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, no, actually, no worries. But you, maybe you can bring up the map again and show the um, viewers where Ponderosa Lake is uh, in relation to it. I'm trying to get this puppy to behave. It's a very productive area. Um, I am. Do you have the, the, the updated satellite map? I thought you had a. Okay. Oh, there um, you go. Okay. This is the ridges. Uh, this is from, I think, either the 70s or 90s. I can't remember. Uh, it's probably 73 aerial photograph. This here is our monster lake, our kind of goofy lake. This little arm off to the right upper area is called Eagle Lake. And next to it, is Ponderosa Lake. I'm going to go to our Geo Earth. And perhaps, Keith, you can show on this map where the um, trails are, like where that road goes around uh, Ponderosa. Okay, most certainly. I'll kind of, tr tr kind of trace it for you. Uh, those who, of you that have not yet been to the state park, uh, you're going to want to look for this, uh, the south unit. That's the street that goes to the south unit. This parking lot here that I'm pointing at is the parking lot for Eagle Lake. There's also a boat ramp for those who also want to collect and fish. This main road goes down to Ponderosa Lake and there's also a boating ramp there. You may notice there's a small path coming through here. That's one of the short paths. But the main path that we will be ta usually take is um, just a little bit south of the main parking lot. There's a few parking areas right here near the chain. There is a cable going across that you can cross over and the path just goes through here. You can dive off anywhere along this path to hunt for concretions. There's no constraints, no limitations. 
keeps following through here. We have a path that goes through here, but you may notice the water. So most of the time, the water level is too high to get past here and the rushes get very thick. And the path keeps going further and further south and then does a hard turn to the east and it continues around the lake. Back up, it's very noticeable on the satellite view. Um, there might be a relative path on this hillside. I have not been on this for a very long time, so I can't see if it's a continuation. But it goes around the water, all the way around the lake. I think this hole might have been in one of the shaft mines. I'm not uh, completely sure. Comes back around, down and around, back to the parking lot at Ponderosa. Yeah, I was gonna say, so Keith, that's probably several miles, wouldn't you say? Two or th at least two and a half miles to circumnavigate when I did, Ponderosa? When I did it on my bike, it said eight miles. So I am, I'm not sure. Um, it's a lot of twists and turns. It's not like uh, a straight path. It's very hilly in places. Um, Andrew and I were there on our bikes uh, after the thaw uh, in late March or April, and we still had ice on the path. Um, so it does make it easier to get around, but to get to the collecting areas, um, even the state park tries to direct people to the area between Ponderosa Lake and Monster Lake. This is quite a large area. There's um, still good places to find concretions. Um, it's just because it's so overgrown, it's a little bit more difficult, not only to get around, but also to find things. So like I said, early March, mid-May is probably the best season to go there. Anything else you'd like to take a look at? Keith, can you briefly show the uh, the northern section? I don't Certainly. know if that parking lot has a name. Yeah, there you are. Just, just. There's because another they... area that we have gone collecting. There's a parking lot is just a little bit to the east of the Eagle Lake parking lot. It's, it has less space, it's a bit smaller. Path goes up north throughout here. We also have a path that goes to the west. Goes through here and back down. You may notice this road that is chained off. This is the tipple. This is where they did a lot of the separation of coal. You may notice it's highly eroded. It used to be a very, very popular collecting location for concretions. Um, it still smells of sulfur. I've gone there once a year just to see if anything has changed. And I have not had a lot of luck finding concretions in the Tipple area. As you can see it's highly eroded. Larry used to be good years and years ago, um, but not so much the last couple of decades, really. Just it's, it's all kind of gone. Um, back to our intersection. The path continues to in a northeastern direction and then cuts almost due west. Meets up, I don't remember the name of this lake, I think it's Long Lake. Actually the path goes up and along through here. This is a very humusy wooded area. It's a bit thicker a bit more difficult to get around in comparison to the Ponderosa uh, Monster Lake area. Uh, it does have ridges. It still has places to be explored. Um, on the old collector map, this was called Tully Territory. Yes, we have found Tully parts there. Um, we have also found Tully parts over in the Ponderosa area. In fact, right where this curve is, goes down and then goes back north. There's, I think it used to be an old road that goes up north through this area here. Um, but I found my 
first tell you in this area, just right around in this general area. Um, eventually the map that I showed you from our um, old time collector will be available on our website. Um, it's a useful guide. Um, if it says Tully, there probably were and have our Tullys in that general area. Uh, the hard part is just being patient and surface collecting to find them. Uh, another thing is that particular map has X's. They're not marking the spot. They're marking spots to not to go to, uh, such as a large area where siderite can be found with very few concretions. So where did the uh, oil pile that we looked at at Brace, where did that come from? In the, I mean, do we know where generally that came from? Um, see if I can zoom into that place. Actually, that was a shaft mine. This is the Braceville spoil pile. I think the shaft is where this pond is. Okay. Um, the shaft, my, uh, wait that a minute. Is, I'm right. in the wrong place. I'm a few miles <laughs> off. There we go. That's better. This pond. Um, you may, those of you who've been to the Braceville spoil mm -hmm. pile, you may remember me mentioning about the red area. Um, we, they had a fire at some point in time, might have been um, spontaneous combustion, there might have been a fire in the, in the mine itself, uh, probably was spontaneous. The shale that is cooked red light is sometimes called red dog. Um, in the case of this marine environment, you're probably not gonna find any fossils in the shale itself and the concretions themselves have been baked and cooked. So they probably, the ones I have found there have been blank and everybody's over time, it says, says don't waste your time digging, uh, collecting there. Getting back to Tully's for a, a little bit. Tully's are found everywhere in the Mazan Creek in the entire Illinois basin in the Francis Creek Shale. The only places I know of the Francis Creek Shale that do not have Tully's is the creek itself and some of the far back areas in pit 11 where it's too fresh watery. But they have found Tully's at Astoria and other places downstate in Fulton County. So they're pretty pervasive in anything that would be considered open marine or maybe even brack, slightly brackish. For those who have boats, always take a visit to Reno Hill. It's in the far southwest corner of Braidwood Lake. Sorry. <laughs> the ridges are getting very steep. Um, some areas on the hill do not produce very well. Um, I would say probably the northern Half of the spoil pile at Torino Hill is probably most productive. Um, the area, if you do go here by boat to lay your anchor is in the north uh, shoreline on the western side. Uh, there is poison ivy even on this hill. So just be aware. Um, we had one of our regular um, members of Ascone go and take his small motorized boat this summer. He visited this ridge line and got lost trying to get back to his boat. Um, that was a mistake. <laughs> and also, why don't you tell them your experience with insect life? Uh, it's very, very overgrown there. And if you want to move your cursor to more like the uh, furthest point inside that inlet, uh, northwest of there. Thought I could make that 110, 120 foot shot straight across that uh, greenery and 
abysmal, horribly overgrown, serious, serious, like through the webbing of your hands thickets when you grab a branch. The ticks themselves, pretty much every time I came to a little bit of a clearing where I could stand up and try to uh, take a breather, I'd look down at my pants and probably have a half a dozen ticks climbing up uh, my upper thighs and just... You can't even kill them. You just brush them off and then keep moving. When I actually got home, I found a bunch of nymphs uh, attached to my calves, probably half a dozen in total. Fortunately, they were dead by that point because I was wearing some kind of, they were, my pants were treated with permethrin, but I treated them probably like a month and a half before. So it wasn't enough to get, keep them out, but I think it was enough to kill them by the time they climbed up a few inches. But yeah, the insect life there, even despite being an island is just abysmal. And the uh, amount of overgrown thorns, bush, dead trees, fall, leaves, debris, everything was just almost impassable. Yeah. We actually ended up uh, finding a, following a ravine, a, a cut down to the uh, water, just you know, following some erosion, which was still horrible, but we were about 40 feet from the boat. So it ended up just swimming for the boat because there was no way we were going to make it out of there in time if we had to cut back through and try to find a uh, terrestrial path to uh, get back where the uh, boat was moored. Um, from what I understand, this year has been terrible for ticks. Um, we've, in effect, have an explosion of ticks. And if you have a high population of deer, um, you are going to have a high population of ticks also. Uh, Catherine, I wanted to return to something you mentioned a little earlier about Braceville. Um, the, bulk of, the bulk of the conversation today has been about Pit 11, which is, is a, a, a strip mining spoil. Braceville, I believe, closed in the late 1800s, and it was an underground mine. So it's essentially a big cone of overburden. And the island now in Braidwood Lake that Keith was referring to, Torino Hill, is actually a vestige also of an old 1800s shaft mine. But when they expanded the, um, the lake to, to, to become a cooling pond, they kind of subsumed that that hill as well and the land around it. Okay. So that's so that 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 cone now that we're looking at is a is a spoil uh, from the shaft mines from an underground mine. Um, I believe it closed in the 1890s, but I'm not 100 percent clear on that. So how, how far recently... underground did they go? Do we? I mean, I'm I'm just curious about the the like the farmlands and all that. How far down would people have to dig before they start finding? The I, 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 I believe, well, they were looking for coal, right? And right. I believe the first coal, and correct me uh, if I'm wrong on this, guys, the first coal was found in the area in Braidwood in what they called the well mine or something mm -hmm. like that, the well, because they were digging for water. They were drilling for water, and they found that um, probably because glaciers had kind of squeegeed a lot of the, the, um, the surface layers off that the shale was only about 50 or 60 feet deep before they hit a coal seam. So it was relatively close to the surface. And when you're talking about digging holes in the ground and getting people and mules and ties, you know, et cetera, down in it, that, that's, that's not having to go too far. Um, there, I know there are other uh, old uh, underground mines in the Danville area mm -hmm. where the coal seam was 200 feet underground. So I think in Northeast Illinois, it was closer to the surface and, and we can thank the glaciers for that. Part of the reason they flooded Torino is they were afraid somebody was going to drop a car in the one of those old shafts because of the fact that they were so shallow, they were starting to deteriorate. So when they made the decision to make the cooling lake to keep people out of there, they just flooded that whole area to take care of the problem. Torino Hill is the only thing that's left of the old town of Torino but they were getting scared about people driving out there trying to collect fossils and losing a car in a shaft hmm. in a tunnel. And if you look at the uh, IDNR maps for uh, Braidwood Lake proper, most of that's only about six feet deep. Wow. Did anybody I, I, go scuba diving there? No, it's, it's not permitted. Although I love, a lot of us collectors have fantasies about scuba diving and dredging and you know, putting, all, a camera on putting a, a, an underwater camera. I mean, I'm sure it's pretty silt, 
laden now. I don't know if you could see the concretions anyway. Um, yeah, the clay itself it has a very silty effect in water. Um, just one brush probably would cloud up your view. That's why you go by feel. Oh, and one, one other interesting tidbit about the underground mines. Um, Michelle Mystic, who has spoken at our club meetings, uh, runs the um, Carbon Hill School Museum. And if you've never been, it's a fascinating structure and collection of a lot of the artifacts um, from that time period, not just fossils and coal mining implements, but a lot of the furniture and clothing, et cetera. And I saw an original map of the Braceville spoil pile. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful design, but I learned that they had almost a city underneath the ground and the mules, sadly, never saw the, day, the light of day. The, the mules were uh, in stalls and they were fed and they lived underground. Um, right. So it was pretty extensive. Yeah, pretty remarkable. And where's that at? That's the Braceville spoil pile. We're no, I mean, but where, where can oh, you- Oh, oh uh, Car Carbon Hill, I think it's on, it's Sixth Street or something like that. Car Carbon Hill uh, School Museum. Okay, thank and, you. And they, they have a website and, and a phone number. And I think you can make an appointment uh, and Michelle will be very generous to show you around. That's a fascinating place. And she-, she knows like Cherry, Illinois. The mules lived underground. They never got out. Yeah. And it was, they think it was a mule that kicked over a lantern there that started the fire that caused that mine disaster in 1906. So no, the mills never got out. They had big fans on the, for venting and it pulled the air through the mine. And that of course just made the fire just spread like, literally like wildfire underground. Yeah. So there's a whole book written on the Cherry Hill mine, the Cherry Mine Disaster. Thank you. I'm gonna check that out. That's very interesting. That's in Cherry, Illinois. That's out, out there by LaSalle. It's that big, used to be, it's that big hill you can see north of I-80 as you go through that area. That's Cherry. Um, we had a question come up about uh, other mines in the area and if there's fossils located in uh, other places. Yes, there are. Uh, there's uh, places uh, across 55, which is private property. Uh, you have to be members to be able to get on the property. Um, I think it was either fossil form or um, Facebook that I've seen some very nice worms come out of. Uh, see if I can find where it is. Uh, number one club, um, not doing well. But all this is old strip mines. Problem is most of it's all private property. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, Keith, this Mar, um, you mentioned that you were in there earlier this year and you got about a, a quarter of a bucket, I think you said. Um, usually every time I go, come back with a quarter bucket. Okay, about what, about how many, <clears throat> how many concretions does that represent? Um, and, and about what percentage actually have something in them? Um, I would say, three to four dozen, okay. varying in size. Thing is, uh, when you're not having, not finding the kind of shapes that you like, you start picking up everything you don't necessarily collect. Um, I would say 40% had something in them. Okay. Um, normally, Again, it's, it's based on knowledge too, on how successful you are. Um, I seen people collecting stuff that I would never pick up. Um, so for those type of folks, I would say 90% are gonna be blank. The rest will have fossils in them. Um, those of us that go to Braceville kind of have a feel of what uh, percentage would be uh, fossils in case of Braceville. Um, I'm guessing if we kept everything, 90% would be blank. The rest would be fossils. Um, of those, of that 10%, 20%, uh, 
uh, that are fossils, um, I'm guessing 80% would be jellyfish. Uh, then you will also find bivalves, scallops. I found a very nice shrimp there once. Um, a fair number of worms can be found at Braceville, um, especially the fan worm, which is what it's named after. We, a lot of folks call it the fan worm hill. So I have a question. Some of my, I know that they were saying when I was there at Bracewood to look for flatter concretions, you know, rounder and flatter. But when I, and I brought home the first day a whole bunch that had a lot of debris on it. I could have reduced my load in half. But when I started, you know, taking off some of the debris and the layers as I've been doing the freeze thaw, I've noticed some really cool fossil impressions in the layers before I even get down to the to the actual concretion. Some of those fossils can be algae mats. If they yeah. look round connecting dots. Um, but I'm just curious, have, have we, has anybody found anything in the layers, you know, rather than just looking inside the, because a lot of mine turned out to be, look like just mud concretion, but there were some interesting shapes in the, you know, in the layers. Not that I know of. You can also have mineralization, which will, again, mislead you to think that it's a fossil. Um, we're getting to the point at Braceville that the concretions are getting to be more like a mudstone. It's getting dark brown in color, which is a bit different from the concretions that we are used to finding with the jellyfish in them. Um, Braceville, the round shapes are most consistent in having fossils in them. You can have very odd shapes. Sometimes you will have bumps in the concretions about a little bit smaller than a dime that are what uh, relatively elongated. A lot of those will, you'll have some luck in finding shellfish in. There's some rather, I can't remember, it begins with an E. Um, one of the shellfish that can be uh, inch long, and, uh, almost uh, three eighths of an inch wide that will be in those bumpy ones. Um, I've gotten in the habit of bringing examples of concretions there now, so we can have a better way of identifying what to keep and what not to keep. The uh, fan worms, especially when they're in a colony, can be in a relatively flat, um, oddly shaped uh, concretion. Um, fan worms are colonial, so sometimes if you're real lucky, you can find six of them in one concretion if you pick up the right one. Yeah, I get a lot of, I've gotten, it seems like they just keep going smaller and smaller and smaller. And I've got a whole bunch of really little um, almond sized ones now. Um, if they're still hard and not shale balls, I would mm -hmm. keep trying. Um, people have found cyclists in, uh, in that spoil pile. Um, it's a small crustacean of sorts. They have antennas that can almost wrap around their whole body. Um, so small is not necessarily bad. I just wanna share that uh, I was, um, I visited uh, old coal mines in Southern Indiana, you know, these spoil piles, uh, finding siderite concretions, mostly with plant fossils, uh, and regularly found the plant fossil on the outside of the siderite concretion. And I'm not sure what that mineral was on the outside, uh, but it was a very noticeable pattern. Um, a lot of us have gone to the canal corridor outing. Um, there you get to walk the creek proper on private property. It's rather pricey, but it goes to Canal Corridor. There you can find concretions. Um, animals been found there. I found a whip scorpion there. Um, the plant life, uh, you're walking on fossils. But to go along with what you were saying, um, the, the fossil layer itself can be in any part of the concretion. Even the outer shell can have something within it, or it could be in the middle of the concretion itself. Well, if there's no other questions, I'm going to stop recording.
And uh, let's just go ahead and open the meeting.